Module 1, Business and Technical Logistics for Pen Testing. In this course, in this chapter especially, you're going to be looking at pen testing, cost, examples, threats, vulnerabilities, exploit code, zombies, botnets. Look at more pen testing, methodology, tools, resources, seven management errors, what to expect, and review and case study. So when you think about what is a penetration test, the idea is you want to evaluate the system. You want to emulate what a hacker would do, except this would be an ethical hacker. Because with this, we're trying to simulate malicious attacks using current exploits, even the human factor through social engineering, as well as potentially showing up and say, I'm the pest control guy. And through, in other words, a physical attack, show up and act the part. So it could be a combination of physical access and good acting skills with social engineering. And the idea is to meticulously go through and look for weaknesses, technical flaws, vulnerabilities in general. We go through the motions of acting as an ethical type hacker. I mean, we're acting like a potential attacker, also known as a hacker, would, would what they would do. But at the same time, there are restrictions. We're not just going to go carelessly through their system and, and with no regard to what we do to them. So there will be a lot of ethics involved with this. So we're looking at active exploitation of security vulnerabilities through electronic or physical means. The reasons we think penetration testing is good is because we're actually trying to have, a, I think, a good awareness of what our weaknesses are so we can manage them better. So when we think about vulnerabilities, we think of our weaknesses. We're hoping if we know what our problems are, maybe we can do something about it. So therefore, avoid the cost of network downtime. It may be necessary based on our particular industry to meet regulatory requirements and avoid fines. We would be better in the long run when it comes to customer loyalty by us being responsible. So you know, it may be even required because of cyber security insurance and may say, yeah, you should, yes, you must prove to us that you are doing a really good job to the best of your ability to be secure, so we're willing to insure you. And, of course, companies could also have data breach insurance. And, you know, since there is so much hacking out there, this could really re be a good idea. In a study, Gardner found out that IT people believe security issues were covered by riders in their business insurance policies, only to find out they weren't. So, of course, the, the cost could vary, and there are obviously these premiums involved with this, and, but yet, at the same time, it may be well worth it when it comes to the protection of our, you know, our systems and everything. Recent attacks and security breaches. I mean, as far as that goes, there's various websites that we could go to. And we'll, think we'll look at a few of these. Regarding websites of interest with recent attacks and security breaches, we have the darkreading.com. And of course, there's a, even a tab for attacks breaches that we could look at. It could be a very interesting read, keeping us up to date on this. Malware surges, U.S. remains biggest source of attacks. Cybersecurity, don't bank on it with third parties and so on. There is the Pen Test Magazine. It has really good information here too. Different workshops are offering here. Computer World, looking at security as well. Of course, the URLs that you go to could differ slightly from the slide. With any website, these are always changing, but these could be you know, pretty interesting. Malware Remodeled, New Tricks, New Suits, Slamming Enterprise Resources. So, reading between the lines, Verizon 2015 Data Breach Investigation Report. Here we have the distributed denial of service, looking at Arbor Networks, and there's an option in there to go to uh, the attack map, and you can see information based on different time periods of distributed denial of service type attacks and so on. Security News Portal, another interesting website. We can kind of go in here and see what the latest cybersecurity news that they have, anything we feel like reading. 14 security patches for March 2015 so on. And also SC Magazine for the security professional, looking at the different, you know, latest news on vulnerabilities, all that for good information for keeping you up to date. And we think about what does a hack cost you. I mean, it's really hard to put a number on it, but it can be just really enormous when you think about it. Because, you know, different companies make different quantities of money. And uh, companies that are really quite busy in their, what they do 
uh, being down could really be hugely detrimental to their financial state. They could lose a lot of money in a short period of time. So, you know, they're giving some averages here of some different breaches, but it could be a really quite a big deal with this. So we don't want to be hacked. I mean, even beyond the initial, I mean, maybe there's some financial loss in the beginning, there is the reputation side. We could actually lose customers due to being hacked. And of course, we can do different, look at different annual reports and we can see, you know, Internet Crime Complaint Center. And of course, do realize many complaints of Internet crime may go unreported. So this could be, when you look at this, this could really be on the low side. And when we think about hackers out there, I mean, there's hackers of different skill level. You could have hackers that are the script kiddies, the least skilled, they're the hobbyists, the specialists to the expert, realizing if it weren't for the really qualified hackers writing these hack tools, then we would not have people that are kind of clueless on how they work, but yet can be pretty effective with them, called script kiddies. I mean, if the people that have these qualifications would not make such wonderful, easy tools to use, then it would maybe take a little more skill to actually accomplish success with these tool sets. And when you think about why people hack, I mean, it, it could just range. I mean, curiosity. Maybe they think they're going to be famous. Maybe being, maybe the next Kevin Mitnick, you know, maybe a younger person thinks, well, I know I might go to jail for a while, but I'll be famous. Now, if someone looks at Kevin Mitnick, the hacker, I mean, he did go to jail for quite a while, but at the same time, now he is pretty successful. I mean, if we were to, you know, just take a quick peek at this hacker. Quick little Wikipedia on him, give us just a really basic history. So, born in 1963, zoom out a little bit, and of course, you know, arrest convicted and got in a lot of trouble but then when we look at him in the future so when some hacker may go well it wasn't so bad you're in jail for a while and but look at all these books maybe he's written wow and he's making all this money because now he's kind of famous and noteworthy so you know, there's there's so much interest in hacking out there that you could see a younger person thinking that would be a neat way to go so maybe it's they're going to get a lot of money, maybe it's, you know, national security, whatever it may be. So all over the place. Now, we see with security vulnerabilities, it actually has a life cycle. The problem is, you know, a pro software product will come out. And after it's being used for a while, some hacker will find out that there's a vulnerability. And, of course, a component gets modified, and then perhaps a patch comes out. But then, you know, whatever the cycle may be, this is the big part, big problem here. The, the patch comes out, but then people don't go and patch that's out there. But then the company kind of goes, well, we need to test it thoroughly before we actually apply it because we're too scared of the systems going down, which is really a reasonable concern. So I have heard companies say sometimes it will be a minimum of 30 days, sometimes 60 days before they will actually apply the patch. So what you have to realize is that there's a vulnerability out there, and if you don't have the patch, you have a vulnerability. But yet we're afraid to put the patch on to fix the vulnerability because we have concerns of it making our systems run in a more unstable way uh, that it just simply will not run properly. So we figured, well, it'd be better to be more vulnerable and hesitate on applying this patch. And that's unfortunate. But that, you know, hackers know that there's a, that's a tendency and you could be weak at that point. So, you know, it doesn't take long. So they say average time is now two hours for a patch to be reverse engineered. So essentially when the patch is out, even if the hackers did not know about the vulnerability, they could study what the patch does, then figure out what it fixed. So companies need to be better at getting into their testing phase and very quickly applying the patch as long as they know that's going to be stable. Now there's something called a zombie and basically these are computers or zombies are computers attached to the internet that have been compromised by a bad guy, basically a hacker. Maybe they have a virus on them, maybe they have a trojan on them, they have some sort of malware on their system. What the thinking is is you could have many systems out there across the world that could be compromised and they become like little robots. They're part of a botnet, like little robots network. 
and they're used to perform malicious tasks on other computers, but they, they work as a group effort, so it ends up being very much magnified. And with this, you know, unfortunately, people may not even know that their system is being used in this way. They may not even know that they're infected. And as far as what they might be doing with this, I mean, it's not necessarily always a denial of service concept. It might be simply propagating spam or doing some sort of activity that they need many systems to perform the activity. So essentially a botnet is a collection of computers connected to the internet and they, they work together to do some sort of distributed task. And again, the people do not know that they're infected necessarily. If they did, they would probably fix it. I think that would be my hope. So these compromised machines are sometimes called drones, might be called zombies, and they have malicious software on there telling them what to do. And it puts together what we call a botnet or a zombie army. And with this, I mean, you had the bad guy out there, the hacker, who had to get enough machines accumulated to get infected so they could basically say, hey, all you machines, go do this for me. So it's very, very important that we keep a good eye on our systems and make sure they stay clean so they cannot be used for this purpose. They say most bot software contains spreaders that automate the task of scanning IP addresses for these vulnerable software holes, in other words, vulnerabilities. And once they find these, the vulnerable machines are attacked and infected with the special software. And they can go from machine to machine. Of course, here we have botnet statistics. There's even a volunteer watchdog group of security professionals that gather, track, and report malware, botnet activity, and electronic fraud. The idea behind this shadow server is to really keep a good eye on this and be aware of the malicious software that's out there and try to tear into it, understand it, contain it, sandbox it, and of course paying attention to malicious attackers. Now I do realize as I switch back and forth between the terms that a hacker can be ethical. And, but usually when you hear me say hacker did this, the hacker did that, I'm thinking black hat type hackers. Now many security books will, make, will decide to use a different term for them. They might use the word malicious attackers or attackers by itself. So when you hear me say hackers, I'm talking about we might consider malicious type people, which the, the slides in the book will tend to use attackers. So both terms are interchangeable in the way I'm using it. And of course, this environment would also pay attention to botnet activities and of course, look at incident response. So with anything, you know, these systems, these systems that are being controlled as in botnets, I mean, we're looking at trying to, you know, find vulnerable systems. You first look for the IPs and then what they're running and planting malware on these systems. Idle scan is just simply a in-map option where you can scan systems. And of course, user behavior, I think, has a lot to do with why people get infected. We have people that are very trusting, they'll click on anything, they'll download anything, and they end up getting infected. Now, when it comes to penetration testing, you have black box testing, and what the idea is, if you've been hired to be the pen tester, you're a bit hired to be the ethical hacker. With this, if they give you no information, we tend to call it black box. It assumes no prior knowledge to the infrastructure to be tested. The testers must first determine location and extent of systems before continuing their, their analysis. I mean, basically you go in knowing nothing. So the way I, I, I think of it is if you're in a black box situation, you're kind of in the dark. You're assuming the role of an outsider. Now, you could also be given all the information they could think of. Say, so here's the diagrams, here's the source code, here's the IP addresses, here's the computer names. Let's give you everything. With the concept of emulating an inside threat, they call this white box because you are given all this information. It's not hidden from you. Then if you're willing to work with the idea of a gray box, then you are essentially kind of in between. They didn't give you everything, but they gave you more than a black box test would do. Now with hacking methodology, we start out with reconnaissance. This is essentially information gathering, whether you gather your information passively or actively. Your passive method may be a matter of just sitting back and sniffing traffic, just listening in, eavesdropping, 
or actively maybe simply doing, going out there and doing who is lookups and looking at the code, doing some sort of social engineering. Now, then we go on to scanning. And with scanning, we're identifying the systems that are actually up and running and what to see, and also seeing what services are on these systems, what is actively running. If there's an email server running on the system, we would pick that up. And we might do what we call a ping sweep or a port scan. We might do essentially a port scan over a range of IPs. And that would essentially give us a lot of information about what machines are up and what they're running. Then we study this and then we look at gaining access. We try to exploit vulnerabilities that we have located to get into the system. We might do something like a buffer overflow or try to force our way into figuring out the password by trying again and again. Then, of course, maintaining access. Once you're in the system, the way you entered the system may not be dependable to continue to be in the system. So at that point, you would upload malicious software so you have these numerous back doors to get back in the system. And with this, you might use a Trojan horse type program, which is known as a back door. Now, covering the tracks. Now, once you've done what you need to do, the concept here is to make sure that there's no evidence that you did what you did. In other words, if you're thinking like a hacker, if I'm a hacker and I've done something, I want to make sure that I hide what I've done. Now, I might start deleting some of the logs, delete or modifying data in the system, if something maybe in the security or the application log, because that could be very incriminating. Now, when we look at this, when we think about penetration testing, footprinting, again, gathering information, there's a lot of internet lookups, Aaron, IANA, different websites we can go to. Um, continuing with the scanning, we try to find out what's running on that computer. What are the services? What are the corresponding port numbers? The operating systems, are they Linux? Are they Windows? If they're Windows, what version? To study the system, because if we know what you're running, you're easier to attack and target. Enumeration. And of course, continuing with more and more you know, I guess a deeper look, we continue to use specific operating system and service techniques and tools to try to find out what accounts, user accounts, uh, shared accounts, uh, any sort of additional information. And, and eventually we call penetration testing. So you're actually trying to get in. And if you can't get in through your normal techniques, you might try denial of service as well, which would be usually a less skilled method. But if you can do the elevation of privileges, sometimes there's exploits you can run that can make you more of a super user, which in the Linux world, we tend to call it root. And on Windows type machines, we tend to call it admin or perhaps administrator. So if we can get in the system and actually elevate ourselves to a higher level, then we might go through and make changes to the data or you know, eventually cover in our tracks. We are trying to emulate a hacker, except we are more restricted and we be, will be more careful. But the idea, if we can do it, and we're the good guy that shows that the bad guy may have, could have, may have been able to succeed here as well. And of course, you could potentially leave back doors. The idea is, well, I'll get to come back and do some more. And as far as penetration testing methodologies, there's different publications, different manuals and such that we can look up. This can be pretty interesting. We have the Open Source Security Testing Methodologies Manual. We have NIST special publications. There are so many of those. The Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council and the Information System Security Assessment Framework. I would say especially like the NIST ones. They're very detailed information when, it, when it, you think about security testing. Now, there is a difference between a hacker versus a pen tester. Now, notice the ethical side especially. I mean, when you look at a hacker... There is no code of ethics. They just simply want something. They're greedy. They have their reasons. They think they're going to be famous. Versus a pen tester does have a strict code of ethics. They have been hired and they're expected to follow the rules. The hacker gains illegal entry. They're unauthorized. We never said they could come in our system. Versus the pen tester has written permission, written authorization that says it's okay. The hacker will just do anything they want to do, even if it hurts the company, versus a pen tester has a set of boundaries that they must follow. The hacker is trying to bypass logging 
because they're not supposed to be there. A pen tester will log and record their activities because they're going to be putting together a penetration testing report later. The hacker has no regard for a report, and if they find any exploits that work, they're simply going to tell everybody about it. And the pen tester will actually present a detailed report of what they did during the test in the end. Exploits vulnerabilities, the hacker, yes, is exploiting. The purpose of the pen tester, yes, you may run some exploits to see how far you get, but the concept is you hope that your information is going to aid the company in finding ways to correct these vulnerabilities. You may even give them recommendations. So hacker, bad guy, black hats, think it's, now it's not boxes, it's hats. So the hat that you wear, if you're a black hat, you're a bad guy, and if you're a pen tester, you're a good guy. We tend to call it a white hat. So when it comes with the different colors with hats, bad guy, black hat, good guy, white hat, what we talked about previously was based on you are a hired pen tester and how much information are you going in with, black box, white box, and so on. Now to be a pen tester, there are numerous tools, and it's good to understand the tools and how it works, but also consider being creative and think outside the box. Sometimes maybe think like a hacker, try to you know, not just depend only on your tool sets, it's not enough. There's also, you know, websites, we've looked at some of these, there's some additional ones here too. And we can, you know, follow information on computer crime and intellectual property. We looked at the Arbor Networks with the distributed denial service. There's even uh, Sec Tools actually has some pretty neat things worth looking at. There we go. Always like this one. And it actually has, and they don't do this every single year, but it does give you an idea of what tools are really popular. They have a top 125 network security tools you can look at. And you can also, on the, on the left side here, under security tools, you could just pick something specific and say sniffers. And you only see what they consider sniffer tools or maybe only wireless tools. And we just see those tools. So I think you'll find a lot of the tools that they mention in here will be in your lab manuals. More websites. We looked at a few of these again. And dark reading, pentestmag.com, we saw that. There's Asta La Vista. Uh, actually, cve.mytree.org. You're going to find if you use some of the better penetration or actually vulnerability assessment tools, many of them, you've got Nessus, you have Saint. We'll talk about these more later will actually refer you to a CVE number, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures number. So it will show you the vulnerability and give you the number that goes with it. It's called a CVE number. And then you can go to numerous websites like this one and look up that number and get more information on it. And there are tools that will help you with security vulnerabilities, understanding security self-assessment. Here's Security Now. Now, there are seven management errors. So seven management errors that lead to computer security vulnerabilities. And these are kind of interesting to look at. First, pretending the problem will go away. I haven't seen that one work yet. Uh, authorizing reactive short-term fixes so problems reemerge rapidly because essentially you're just kind of putting a Band-Aid on it. Failing to realize how much money your information and organizational reputation is actually worth. If you lose your reputation, you're losing, generally losing your customers, and that could bring a company down. Relying primarily on a firewall and intrusion detection systems. But although those are good, that's not all you need to do. You need to look at the big picture, have a very layered approach, and not just have these single dependencies. Failing to deal with the operational aspects of security. Make a few fixes and then not allow the follow-through necessary to ensure the problems stay fixed. So it's a matter of not cutting too many corners. Failing to understand the relationship of information security to the business problem. They understand physical security, we do not see the consequences of poor information security. Security is multifaceted. It's not just one side of it that you have to solve. Assigning untrained people to maintain security and not providing the training or the time to make it possible to do the job. And then we expect that us to have miracles from that when they don't know how to do their job. Well, that's obviously a big error. 
So, you know, it comes to our future. I mean, we're just going to see potentially more and more of different types of attacks. I mean, cyber espionage, yeah, social engineering, botnets never leave us. Mobile devices, get anti-theft protection, and we're seeing all, all of this in place. So in this chapter, we got kind of a fresh look at penetration testing, understanding the, you know, the problems with it, exploits, zombies, botnets, some of the techniques, seven management errors, and of course what we could see as we go along.